Our bodies are complex machines. Well, relatively complex. Our respiratory system, while vital, is actually a pretty straightforward piece of engineering. We breathe in air, which of course contains that life-giving oxygen, and we breathe out carbon dioxide, a waste product of our metabolism. It's all smooth sailing up to this point, a perfectly balanced exchange. But the trouble starts, and it can start quickly, when we're unable to effectively remove that CO2 from our system. This buildup, this retention of carbon dioxide, is what we call hypercapnia, and it can throw our body's delicate chemistry completely out of whack. Now, as the name suggests, hypercapnia, hyper meaning higher or excessive, and capnia referring to carbon dioxide, literally translates to too much carbon dioxide in the blood. And this excess CO2 isn't just a minor inconvenience. It sets off a chain reaction within the body, impacting everything from our breathing rate to our brain function. Think of it like this. Our bodies operate within a very specific range, a delicate balance of chemicals and processes. When CO2 levels rise, this balance is disrupted, leading to a condition called respiratory acidosis. This means the blood becomes more acidic, and our bodies are incredibly sensitive to even slight shifts in pH. So, what happens when this delicate balance is thrown off? Well, before we get into the what, we should really understand the why. Why does hypercapnia happen in the first place? Several factors can contribute to a buildup of CO2 in the blood. The most common culprit is hypoventilation, which, in simple terms, means breathing too slowly or too shallowly. Think of it like a chimney that's not drawing properly. The smoke, or in this case the CO2, can't escape efficiently. This hypoventilation can be caused by a variety of underlying conditions. One major cause is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, a group of lung diseases that damage the airways and make breathing difficult. But COPD isn't the only reason. Neuromuscular disorders like muscular dystrophy or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, can weaken the muscles responsible for breathing, leading to hypoventilation and CO2 retention. Certain medications, particularly those that suppress the central nervous system, can also slow down breathing and contribute to hypercapnia. And even something like severe obesity can play a role, as excess weight can restrict lung expansion and make it harder to breathe deeply. So, as you can see, the causes of hypercapnia are quite diverse, and understanding the root cause is crucial for effective treatment. Now, with that in mind, let's explore what happens when CO2 levels start to climb. Now, with that in mind, let's explore what happens when CO2 levels start to climb. Our bodies have a built-in alarm system, constantly monitoring the levels of various substances in our blood, including CO2. When these levels rise above a certain threshold, the alarm goes off, triggering a cascade of physiological responses. The first responder is the respiratory system itself. The brainstem, the control center for breathing, detects the increased CO2 and sends signals to the diaphragm and other respiratory muscles, telling them to work harder. This usually translates to faster and deeper breaths, a desperate attempt to expel the excess CO2 and restore balance. You might notice someone with hypercapnia breathing rapidly and shallowly, or even using accessory muscles in their chest and neck to help them breathe. It's their body trying to compensate. The brain is a major target of hypercapnia. It's incredibly sensitive to changes in blood chemistry, and rising CO2 levels along with the resulting respiratory acidosis have a profound impact on its function. As CO2 builds up, it reacts with water to form carbonic acid, which then releases hydrogen ions, making the blood more acidic. This increased acidity directly affects brain cells or neurons. Neurons rely on a delicate balance of ions to generate electrical signals and communicate. The increased hydrogen ion concentration disrupts this balance, interfering with how these ions move across neuronal membranes and affecting neuronal excitability. This disruption can manifest in various ways. Initially, you might experience headaches, drowsiness, and difficulty concentrating. These symptoms are often subtle. As CO2 levels climb, neurological symptoms become more pronounced, including confusion, disorientation, and irritability. The impaired ion balance can slow nerve impulse transmission, leading to slower reaction times and cognitive difficulties. In severe cases, CO2 narcosis can occur. The high CO2 levels essentially sedate the brain, leading to lethargy, extreme drowsiness, and even coma. The acidosis can suppress neuronal activity, contributing to this lethargy. Furthermore, changes in pH can affect the blood-brain barrier, 
potentially allowing harmful substances to enter the brain and worsen neurological effects. So, it's the acid created by the CO2 that disrupts the brain's delicate neurochemistry, causing a range of neurological symptoms from subtle cognitive impairments to life-threatening conditions, like CO2 narcosis, which is a medical emergency. So, we've covered the theory, but let's make this real. Now watch this to get some practical knowledge with a case study. We'll walk through a scenario involving ventilator management, showing you how we assess and treat hypercapnia in a real-world setting. This will give you a better understanding of how the concepts we discussed actually apply in clinical practice. If you're serious about taking your clinical skills to the next level, join our courses on advanced clinical skills and ECG mastery, trusted by millions. Nah, just kidding. But seriously, I've designed them to be fun, engaging, and super practical, so you can level up your skills without the boring lectures. Hit the link below, sign up now, and see you inside.